Baby, can you dig your man? He's a righteous man. Gracias, everybody, for joining us for this 40th anniversary celebration all about The Stand, Stephen King's most epic work, in my estimation, that he has ever done. Appreciate you all coming out. So we are essentially going to be taking a little bit of a look at all of the different variations of this book. If, from I, if I may, Fuego. Welcome to the horror show. Yes, yes. I'm Cecil Laird. Yeah, can you tell the nervousness? I'm Jaime and Fuego. I'm Marsh Parker. Oh, I'm Christopher R. Smith. And I'm producer Dave. <laughs> yes, and right. gracias very much, y'all, for uh, joining us here. This is a presentation of The Horror Show. Uh, twice a week, I do a program called Hail to Stephen King, which is where I basically talk all things King. Uh, over the last eight years, I took the task upon myself of reading every single one of his books. It was arduous. It was insane. But, the you know, The Stand is still one that really just holds... Just, just holds precedence with me because, you know, he's tried to do epic, you know, even as recently as Sleeping Beauties last year, but I don't really think he has really just hit the nail on the head anywhere near as well as he did with this, this particular insane epic of his, and that's why even 40 years later, they're talking about adapting it again. Josh Boone was the most recent person who was trying to get this done. Still hasn't happened yet, but uh, we're going to be basically taking a peek at all the different iterations of this. We have the Marvel comic book that was uh, four years in the making just a few years ago. My dude Cecil just got done rereading that. Literally uh, about mm, 45 minutes ago, I finished the last issue while waiting for a uh, Will Wheaton photo op. So. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, and I just got done rereading the, uh, the uncut and extended version of the novel where, you know, King did some decade alteration and stuff like that, uh, which was still cool. And I also got done rewatching the 1994 miniseries, which I know there are mixed feelings about. But... Uh, yeah, we'll talk I'm, about that. <laughs> very, very mixed feelings, right? So uh, first and foremost, we are going to talk about the novel, the source material. Uh, 40 years ago, in 1978, that's when Stephen King initially published this, and uh, it was republished in uh, the 80s, and he switched it up to 1985 for the paperback edition, and then when he did the uncut version, which you see way over there, he switched the decade to 1990. I'm not sure why he wanted to make this, you know, this little decade swap and jump in type stuff, but... Uh, yeah, honestly, I adore this book so very much, and I'm just going to kind of jump down the line and get some thoughts from everybody. I guess we'll, we'll jump to Dave first and foremost, man. When Sweet. was the first time that you read this book, and uh, as far as like memories of the storytelling, uh, where is some of the resonance for you, man? Well, uh, my perspective is going to be mostly from the unabridged book and also from the miniseries on TV. But also, um, I was going to say, you know, the task of reading Stephen King, it's a journey. Very much seems so. like every one of his books takes us on a journey of characters and The Stand is no different. And I think the coolest part about The Stand is you have such a large cast of characters. So I think one of the things that really I enjoyed about it was it was a post-apocalyptic novel, first of all. So that's what initially drew me to the story. And then, of course, it was Stephen King, so that's always awesome. <laughs> and then the, the symbolism and the parallels that happen with this is, in my, my opinion, Stephen King's revelation, ver version of revelation. And so it was very important to him, and that's why I think he put it out so many times in so many different versions, some things that he cut out, some things that he left in. Um, but overall, I think my, my first experience with uh, The Stand was in high school, and I think I read the regular version, and then recently, uh, two months ago, I reread the unabridged. So it's great. It's my favorite. <laughs> it's my favorite Stephen King, for sure. Yeah, definitely top, top three for me, man. So Even the um, miniseries. Even the miniseries, one yeah. of my favorite I still Stephen love King the miniseries, miniseries, man. Like, yeah, yeah. We'll yeah. talk about that. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I mean, compared to all, some of the other Stephen well, King yeah, miniseries. Well, yeah. So, all right. <laughs> well, well Christopher, bad. I guess that's a good spot for, for you to jump in, man. What was your first experience with The Stand? Okay, uh, well, Stephen King, um, my dad is a huge Stephen King fan, so there were Stephen King books just around the house all the time, and I wasn't allowed to read them because they were for adults, which means <laughs> I read them when they weren't around. And The Stand was one of them. I'm that much of a nerd where I was sneaking reading The Stand. Um, uh, I think I, I only know the extended version. I don't know that I've ever read the, uh, um, the original published version, but it's the extended version that I know. And, uh, yeah, and I reread it again, all 1,400 pages of it. And uh, it's, uh, it's good. No. That's a weird thing. Like, like, not, I mean, of course, it's good, but like rereading again, it's like, this is a damn good book. And, uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's definitely dense. So, Cecil, what was your first experience with it, man? Was it the miniseries or... Uh, uh, yeah, my first experience was the miniseries. I actually, um, I'm going to be the one talking mainly about the comic and the miniseries. I never got around to the book because 
it was so daunting looking. Uh, <laughs> it <laughs> essentially like, the like it's, it's a brick. I, I, yeah, <laughs> I was never. I was the guy in school that, n as long as I paid attention in class, I never had to crack a textbook. And I never wanted to. And so that thing looked like about seven textbooks. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I, it just scared me enough. Between that and it, I was like, this guy has a lot of words in his head. And <laughs> I don't want to take the time to put them in mine. So, um, you know, but in retrospect, I believe, because I went on an interesting journey here this week. Um, I'm actually kind of pissed at Stephen King right now because <laughs> I had to binge the entire audiobook of Pet Cemetery, rewatch that movie, and then watch all or read all 31 issues of this comic because I was not going to squeeze in a 1,400-page book before this con. Um, but I, I literally that have been chained. <laughs> I've, I've had to chain myself to Stephen King for the last two weeks. Um, but my experience listening to um, Pet Cemetery was like, oh. He really is an awesome writer. I think that's the first time I've done one of his books all the way through. I say done because I didn't read it, but, um, but I see the intricacies of his writing. And unfortunately, when we get to the comic, I'll talk about the fact that I could not help but see the gaps in the comic where I'm like, oh, there must have been 30 pages of character development for this guy that I'm just not seeing right now. So um, I'm a little upset that I never got around to reading the book. But yeah, my first experience was the miniseries. At the time I liked it, in retrospect, it holds up about as well as it, which is to say not very well. Yeah, uh, first uh, ex experience for me was definitely the, the miniseries as well. And with my religious upbringing, you know, just the, the resonance of the whole good versus evil. And, you know, I'm, I'm like a Bible teacher's son, guys. So, I mean, just the indoctrination portion of all of this was big time for me. And I still remember the first time I ever heard Blue Oyster Cult was actually not there's more cowbell or any of that crap. It was don't. First time I heard Don't, Don't Fear the Reaper was you know, in the miniseries where they're showing all those people dead after Captain Tripp's first escapes and stuff. And I still find that song chilling because of that as opposed to thinking of Will Ferrell you know, conking on a cowbell. And if but, you watch uh, it on uh, YouTube, yeah. um, they cut in and out of the song because they, can't, they don't have the uh, copyright rights to it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. Makes sense. That's Makes why sense. that happens. Yeah, but I, I took the, the daunting task of reading this book about six years ago. That, like, honestly, The Stand was my gateway drug to Stephen King because of the fact that when I found out that Randall Flagg is in other versions of Stephen King books, namely The Dark Tower and even popping up in Eyes of the Dragon, that was when I was like, okay, I have to read all of this stuff so I can see how everything kind of ties in. It's and a potent first dose. It is, yeah. yeah. I still think he's the most iconic villain that uh, you know, King has ever concocted. He was given a big disservice in Book 7 of the Dark Tower, at least in my estimation. But, um, you know, I'm actually going to just uh, pose a question to the rest of the panel here. You don't want Marsha's first experience? Oh. Am I part of this panel or am I just... You are uh, most definitely a part of this panel. <laughs> what was your first King experience uh, with regards to the stand, Marsha? The stand. So with the stand, I remember watching the miniseries when it came out, um, and I was quite quite young, so I didn't really grasp everything and what was going on. Um, and then I rewatched it about four years ago, and I'm like, okay, I I'm getting behind this. I love the characters. I'm really interested. And, and finally, I got to actually reading the book, because I, like Cecil, looked at the book, and I'm like, I read a lot, and I don't know if I can tackle this. This is a lot. So I did tackle it. I tackled it via audiobook, because I'm a new mom, and that's how I can consume literature now. Um, and it, it was great. It, there was a lot of characters in there that you could get behind. Even the characters you don't want to get behind, you start to, to see their point of view. And I think that is a very powerful thing as a writer to be able to do that. Um, even Randall Flagg, I was starting to feel for him at the end of it. And he's a horrible, horrible creature. <laughs> um, but I think as a new mom and just the beginning, like it was really tough for me just like with all the death and the children and no mercy and and it didn't there's this like disease that had it didn't matter who you were who you are or where you were and you if you weren't immune you were dead and it's just just the thought of seeing these bodies everywhere and just no the fact there is no mercy of of who's selected and who's not selected it's it was very powerful and very moving so so i i got behind it <laughs> and uh, I'm excited to discuss this more. 
Awesome, awesome. Now, so with a, before I jumped all over Marsha there and forgot to in include her properly, I was going to ask everybody else, um, so what is like either a sequence or a character or something in, in particular as far as just the, the massive element of storytelling that just stuck out to you? For me, one of my, my favorite scenes is where you're going through the, uh, the Lincoln Tunnel, I, I believe it was. It's like a daunting and scary, scary thing. And, uh, you know, that's where, you know, Larry... Uh, is you know just trying to face his fears and you know do do his damnedest. Uh, Larry Underwood is also my my favorite character in the stand. He's he's my favorite Stephen King character period because he's such an amazingly flawed protagonist. And um, you know Stu Stu Redmond is uh, you know kind of one of those guys who you know he's he's the everyman and he has just everything kind of conveniently go his way. Larry unfortunately kind of a tragic character. So I'm gonna kick it back to Dave on the end, man. So why don't you go to Marsha the first six minutes? Okay. Well yeah, let's perfect. let's let's alter it then. <laughs> let's <laughs> let's go to Marsha. So uh, what is a character that you enjoyed the most, I identified a lot with, um, something um, like that. Before you like shat all over him, I was gonna say Stu. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I love giving Jaime a hard time, watch her show. Um, <laughs> No, yeah, Sue. I I like Sue because yeah, he was the everyday man, and I don't. I disagree. I don't think everything just came his way. I think he just was the type of peop person that would take charge, and realize something needs to get done. I'm gonna do it. He was a, he was a true leader, and even when he wasn't really prepared to be a leader, he still stepped in that role. And even and even towards the end, when he had to give up that role and say, you know you know, you have to leave me here and you have to carry this on. I'm willing to sacrifice myself for the better good. I mean, that's, it's amazing that, that there's a character in the story that's able to, to put himself forward and be that leader. I'm, I'm, a, I'm the type of person who wants to be a good leader. I want to lead by example and I want to believe that I would do the right thing. Um, there's been times that that's contrary to the statement, like knocking my friends down in haunted houses so I can get away, <laughs> and you know, it's things like, like that. But I admire those who who can do the the right thing, and so I say Stu. Yeah, he yeah, had some major integrity. I'm not gonna not gonna denounce <laughs> that. So um, I guess I will jump uh, to to Cecil over here, man. What's uh, like a character no, or a situation in the book that just really really yeah. resonated? Yeah, um, I did like the uh, the tunnel sequence you were talking about. Actually, the comic. That was the one I remember the most from the miniseries, but the comic actually took a whole issue just on that, and all the things that Larry is envisioning, they, you know, Mike Perkins, the artist, actually puts out there, so he shows the zombie guy with the knife in his neck coming at him at one point in his imagination, so I did like that, but as far as the character goes, um, I'm going to kind of cheat, because the first one might not be, con I mean, it's not a human character, but Kojak is uh, oh, okay. one of my favorite characters because he was so Everyone like useful and cool and loyal and stuff. But Persistence. going with a human, mm -hmm. I'm going to say uh, M-O-O-N spells Tom Cullen. There you go. Uh, there you yeah. go. I love Tom favorite. Cullen. He's, I, I, I love the, you know, the visualization of his trances that uh, Perkins did in the comic. And the fa you know, just it, Tom's whole story and the fact that he's sort of the dark horse and he infuriates Flag because he can't see him and stuff. Like, it, there was just so many layers to such a literally simple character. Um, I, I just, I, I couldn't help but love good old Tom Collin. Okay. Chris, what are you thinking, man? All right, uh, uh, my favorite actually is uh, Glenn Bateman. Oh, thank God. Nice. Uh, awesome yeah. interplay with yeah, Stu, yeah, I must say. Yeah. Um, because he had a certain distance to the entire thing that was happening, the end of the world, basically. And he's a sociologist, mm -hmm. a college professor, and is able to view it from a, like, this was actually kind of interesting to him, just seeing it unfold in front of his eyes. And uh, maybe he's not the, you know, nicest character or something, but... Uh, Lots of skepticism on his part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but it's, it would be fascinating to see that as someone who had theorized about what society and culture is so much, and then to be able to see it before your eyes. The way he does, yeah. So, heck yeah, it's Glenn, Glenn Bateman, right? Yeah. Glenn dude. Bateman. Yeah. How about you, Dave? Well, I hope you're not going to say garbage, ma garbage man, trash, trash can, man, because <laughs> man, man, that's that's trashy. Um, and specifically the um, the sequence where he has his first vision of Flag uh, after he's blowing up. Uh, I think it's in I can't remember what it's Texas or something like that. He's blowing up the giant oil reserves, mm. and um, it was just one of those things where we're all lost sometimes, and, and whether you're open to 
one side or the other, you know, one side's going to have influence over you, and you're going to choose that side. And I, I just enjoyed that we got to watch his whole self-destruct, and, and that was sort of like the beginning. He should have died in that huge explosion because he set off his, you know, explosives too early, but he actually stuck around long enough, like... God had a plan for him to <laughs> blow everybody up at the end, you know, <laughs> like um, like you were saying about Larry uh, and Stu and even Glenn, like everybody plays these sort of uh, very important pivotal roles and there's really no superfluous characters that, that we really follow. I mean, there are some extra characters in the, in the, in the book, but most of the time you're really excited. And I, and I, I think uh, Trash Can Man is a, a little bit more relatable than Randall. I mean, Randall's just, you know, he's just the bad guy. But Trash Can Man is kind of like you, he's like the bad version of Tom Cullen. He's exactly, kinda, yeah. He's kind of simple and he has an agenda and he just wants to watch the world burn. <laughs> and uh, you can't fault him for that because that's just the way he is. You know? I mean, you kind of can. <laughs> <laughs> he, well, he saves the day. I no. mean, he d- he d- he's he actually the anti-hero. <laughs> he belongs in prison so he doesn't burn stuff down. But I mean, ultimately, he's mentally He's like the broken. most sympathetic of the yeah. uh, Vegas people. Yeah, basically. there you go. Yeah. Well... Yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I totally dig the Tom Cullen comparison, though, because he was almost the wild card on the other side that you couldn't predict what he was going to do, and, you know, he ended up effing everything up for Flag, obviously. That's but one of the problems, actually, I had in, in engaging with the full story for the first time was, like, Flag's, like, this really badass villain, mm-hmm. seems like, but... Like, he has two glaring mistakes, you know, and it's like... He's fallible. How, yeah. how, like... He just doesn't, like, in every other part of the book, he seems like a guy that wouldn't make these kinds of mistakes or wouldn't allow them to continue. Like, he literally gets warned about Trash Can Man um, Blinded not, by not terribly long before the nuke shows up. He has a soft spot up. for him, though. But <laughs> I know, but it's like, he's, but how soft a spot can Randall Flagg really but, have? Mm-hmm. Like, that's, that's the got, thing. Like, he seems so hardcore and evil, and yet he's brought down by two, like, and, and one specific very huge thing that he just kind of lets go I, and it was a little yeah. weird for me but. he ended up paying for it obviously yeah. so, <laughs> you know one one sequence that uh, specifically is in the book so i know that chris and uh dave can can mention this but um there is so much more of an emphasis on military corruption on uh you know covering things up i mean the the sequence where the the protests are going down and they mow down all the kids and yeah. stuff like that and also media suppression where they start killing journalists and things like that i mean even in the miniseries not in the comic <laughs> yeah, 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 even in the miniseries where you have kathy bates character who's yeah. telling it like it is and then she gets killed and stuff i mean it just was a very dark viewpoint on on government i and guess <laughs> one of the most i think potent ver- uh moments in the book it wasn't in the miniseries at all but um was when the um Black soldiers took yeah. over the, and then they were basically doing a game show on the air. Game show they execution. Were execution. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a very potent, like uh, just like that was Stephen King at yeah. his. Mm-hmm. And I like that how the people vicious. watching the show thought it was actually like There's television. Show, it wasn't yeah. real, and they're mm-hmm. like, "That's that's really good special uh, practical effects they yeah. have." Yeah. Yeah. Also, not in the comic. <laughs> yes. Jesus. Oh yeah. Oh, this what did I waste my time on? <laughs> Yeah, it's Do you want me to share the Audible book for you? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you it's know, like if you forty if something if hours. <laughs> if you uh, forty three. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's if vicious. you you can actually listen to it at four times speed if you do the Stephen King uh, powder. You know? <laughs> 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 Stephen King powder. You can finish it in three days. days. <laughs> no. so you can listen to it. You know, he, he's yeah. like talking really fast. But that that was such a uh, perfect example of how extreme things can go mm-hmm. yeah. when society collapses mm-hmm. and just like. Those uh, one, and I was going to say just to dovetail onto that is, is the the government killing people to keep a secret. Oh yeah, that's been done now in so many other things mm-hmm. that you wonder sometimes like if it's not part of the, you know, I don't think he started yeah, but it, but the like, government was the last to admit that right. this disease was happening. Yeah, yeah. Which, well, and they even went and unleashed it in other areas of the world so they wouldn't get it pinned on them and right. stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just yeah. crazy the lengths that yeah. they went to. Mutually assured destruction, right? True. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so another little sequence that I just want to dovetail on and mention is, uh, so in chapter 8, there's, uh, there's basically the description of how quickly this virus actually spreads and the way that it's just, you know, so easily con- com- communicable. communicable. That's the word that I'm looking for. Yes, yes. And so that was an awesome sequence, I, I must admit. And then that, that's one I'm of Stephen King's, like, best... 
I think just writing wise, while just going from character to it, character, it flows yeah. every few sentences, and it flow like you said, flows. That was a so two-page well, spread. Like, Jesus, <laughs> don't pop your peas, guys. That was a two-page spread in the comic book. Yeah. So all of that was done in two pages, about eight eight different panels, mm-hmm. and I was like, that's really cool. Yeah. I wish it was more than two pages. <laughs> but the way he's able to communicate that so beautifully, like beautifully, like it is, it's he uses very simple language. Stephen King isn't someone that you you know he doesn't use very baroque uh prose mm-hmm. but um it just saw how perfectly it went from character to character to character across the country yeah and yeah that was a an excellent sequence yeah and another similar one that i have to make mention of is uh the whole no no great loss chapter where it basically talks right. about oh, yes, all of the yes. people yeah. Yeah, yeah. dying Larry that fell didn't, off die, <laughs> didn't die from the flu but you know they just found yeah. themselves in these horrible different predicaments from the five-year-old kid Ted his, shot, his, his, his parents are dead he's just wandering around doing his own thing falls in a well i mean that's a scary yet satisfying chapter especially for me yeah mm-hmm. No, I, I enjoyed that. I think they had a, someone fall off a ladder or, or a billboard or something like that, mm-hmm. and that was it. No great loss. Your survival is over. He says a lot in his books. <laughs> nice. Uh, so, so Marsha, um, yeah. let me see. Der, der, der. Should, should we segue into the miniseries? Or? Yeah, we can go into the miniseries. I think it's about time. Yeah. Gary Sinise. <laughs> I don't think that's ever been said that way before. Oh, yeah. Gary Sinise. Gary Sinise. <laughs> so yeah, this was made in 1994, and uh, it was shortly after King had published the uncut version of the book, and so it does factor in some of those those things and whatnot. But Mick Garris, a constant King collaborator, he had just directed two years previously, Sleepwalkers, which I think is a little bit underrated as far as King stuff goes. <laughs> All right. uh, All right. If you're into you know weird uh, Oedipus Rex shit and whatnot, but uh, yeah, I actually this is his longest miniseries if I'm not mistaken. So I mean, it's six hours. It was broadcast in four different portions, but yet it still had to be a cliff notes of so many things and streamlined so much. And so I actually still enjoy it a lot, but I know there's people who compare this just like they do the original version of it, the miniseries, as far as it feels dated, it feels very 90s. It, it definitely looks like TV, unfortunately. It's not quite as cinematic as I would like it to be, but it still holds a very special place in my heart. Uh, Marsha, thoughts on the, on the miniseries? I think they did a good job for a miniseries, the 90s miniseries um, that they can do. I mean, they had a really great cast in it. All-star cast, no. All-star cast. Um, everybody was, I mean, even the acting wasn't that bad, considering what it could have been. Mm. <laughs> High praise from Mark. <laughs> <laughs> King did write the screenplay for this, too. Yeah, but. yeah. But no, I think they did a really good job incorporating all the highlights from the book into the miniseries. And for those who don't uh, um, have the time to read the book, I think it's a good cliff notes for it. And they address all the main points. And, and you love all the same characters the way you love them throughout the book. So I, I watched it, I actually rewatched it again. And um, yeah, it just it wasn't, it wasn't bad. I mean, I have a tendency of hating things after I read the book. And I didn't hate it. So that's my review. Of <laughs> Didn't hate it. I didn't hate it. It's actually glowing from my Nice, nice. That was a glowing review. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know, com- compared to your thoughts on it, right? Mm, I mean, uh, we're we'll not doing that, that panel today. Yeah. <laughs> well, here, here, I'll jump in. I'll jump in. I'll say that. Go on. The, the miniseries, in my opinion, is the pinnacle of 90s miniseries <laughs> technology. <laughs> and if you are born in the 90s or from the 90s, like if you watched that on TV, that was, it was awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Does it still hold up? Mm, a little bit. Not really. I think but, Stephen King did better with another miniseries. Yeah, but uh, at the time, I think it was, it was really good. And also it has a, a great cast, so the acting is good. Uh, <laughs> Through the whole thing, it's like, it's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, um, I mean, you got Molly Ringwald, you have Ed Harris in an uncredited role. Gary you've, you've got like cameos oh, yeah. out the ass from everyone, oh, no. from Sam Raimi to <laughs> John Landis to. I mean, yeah, it's a fantastic cast. Uh, it is a good Cliff Notes version of of the story. Yeah. But again, one of the cool things that I liked about the miniseries is it gave faces to all the characters that I feel like were really well cast. And so when, then when I read the book, I have you know, faces to go mm-hmm. onto the characters that I create in my head, and, and it's more enjoyable for me having that. So now when I read it and I see Gary Sinise too, I'm like, oh, Gary Sinise is wandering around in my head, you know, mm-hmm. hanging out with Molly Ringwald, <laughs> making babies. Franny. <laughs> it's the head of Dave Friedman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gary Sinise and Molly Ringwald making babies. Yeah. Yeah. 
Christopher, thoughts on the miniseries, man? Do you, uh, do you like it? Do you think it holds up? <laughs> I do not think it holds up. Really? I, it was, I watched it again for this panel, and um, it's better than I remember it, but it's still not great. No. Um, and I feel like it hits all the plot points of the novel, but um, I actually think uh, Stephen King wrote the, the uh, teleplay. He did write the Oh, yeah, I forgot. Yeah, for himself. That was the yeah. second best part of Stephen King's and event. That's something like when Stephen King himself writes a screenplay or a teleplay. Mm, not always it's as good. Not always the best. And then he puts himself in it. Yeah, well, when he yeah, puts he was playing I, Teddy, I right? That, but <laughs> great. Yeah. That's great. Another reason why I love it. Yeah, because I, I think he's a brilliant novelist, but not the best screenwriter mm-hmm. and or television writer. And uh, yeah, so I don't think he was the best person to adapt his own story. Yeah, he doesn't believe mm-hmm. in brevity. Yeah. <laughs> and I think kind of because um, it's such a, a huge story that when it's boiled down to that point. It starts to get kind of like a soap opera and melodrama-ish, where like um, it, in the book there was so much uh, nuance to these characters that uh, it, it worked. Like the the story worked, but when you boil it down to just big plot points, it can kind of sound kind of silly. No. Like the the story of the stand can seem a little absurd, but um, when you boil it down, but the way he played it out in the novel was there was so much depth to these characters that you you go along with it and like. Okay, yes, I get why this is happening. The miniseries kind of had to push it into, you know, these chapters of, you know, between commercials. And uh, I That's actually one of the worst things when I was yeah, rewatching it, is you can yeah, the see the commercial yeah. breaks. Yeah. And it doesn't flow as well because of that. Yeah. And then I, I do want to say, though, uh, uh, in the 90s, the Stephen King adaptation, that was like a big thing, mm-hmm. the Stephen King miniseries, uh, Storm of the Century. Which underrated, man. I oh, love very Storm underrated, of the Century. Yes. That was a dark ending. <laughs> that was one he wrote for television. That was not based on a novel. That was an original piece mm-hmm. that he wrote for the TV miniseries. And that's an excellent one. So, yeah, if you're a Stephen King fan, uh, Stephen King's Storm of the Century is, is fantastic. It's a lot better than The Golden Years. <laughs> the, book, the, golden, the, book yeah. is even, the book is even in script format. Yes, yeah, the book right. is an actual screenplay, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, honestly, I actually want to give some credit to Miguel Ferrer in the, uh, you know, rest peacefully, sir. I thought he was exceptional as Lloyd, and he actually brought a lot more depth to that character than I really felt when I was, you know, actually reading him on, on the page. You could kind of just see that he was a little bit more of a complex character, and he was somebody who was wrestling with, you know, loyalty versus what he felt was right and stuff like that. And he's also in an underrated adaptation called The Night Flyer, which I think is also an awesome Stephen King adaptation that doesn't get enough credit and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, the the all-star cast was pretty phenomenal. And I still, I mean, once again, dude who played Larry Underwood, the actor, uh, his his name's eluding me. He didn't do a ton of other stuff. He was on a terrific Tales from the Crypt episode. Uh, Guy didn't get a lot of work, but, I mean, I still think of him singing Eve of Destruction and, you know, just in the isolated area of New York and stuff like that. That's and that's just a very I- iconic scene for me. That's I actually really something I, I didn't like the character of Larry Underwood in the miniseries. Really? Like I did in the book. Yeah. Interesting. Like I, yeah, I, I found him, yeah, he kind of, in the book he had kind of uh, acknowledged that he had been an asshole for part of his life, basically. Oh, yeah. And was re- trying to redeem that, even though he didn't know how. And I thought I found that a very compelling character. In the miniseries, he was just the asshole. <laughs> mm. And then of course, we saw him kind of, you know, have to face that. But I, I feel like um, the book was did such a better job of um, giving us that character that had realized the error of his ways mm-hmm. and wanted to fix them and didn't know how. And I thought that was such a, a better character than was depicted in the miniseries. Interesting. Well, I still stand stand by my you know opinion there, but uh, no. yeah, man, Larry Underwood, I still you know dig dig the hell out of that guy. Baby, can dig your man. So uh, so this monster over here is what Cecil just got done tackling over the course of the last week or so. Um, it took them four years, 31 issues to do this comic book. Uh, you know, and this was shortly after. That, you know, Marvel had just got done doing the Dark Tower, and so they were looking for, you know, something to kind of hang their hats on and something to roll with. And it was a hell of a creative team. You said Mike Perkins, he was the, the artist He's behind the artist. it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I think this is actually a better representation as far as an adaptation goes than the miniseries. But uh, since you just got done tackling it, man, what's your, what, what's your thoughts on the experience? Uh, well, real briefly, I'll give my opinion on the miniseries. Um, cause oh, <laughs> derps. Um, yeah, I, I enjoyed the miniseries. Um, the, my, my biggest problem with the miniseries was how friendly Flag was every time we saw him. Like, he, mm. he had little flares of anger, He's but for the most boy. part, he was like, 
he was like nice guy flag, like, yeah. hey, what's up, guys? You know, like, uh, I'm mm-hmm. gonna kill you if you do anything wrong. All right, you know. It's, <laughs> You did? There's a, there's a miss. Yeah, okay, but we never really, we didn't see it that often. Crucifixions were very fun. I mean, well, yeah. we saw that in the comics. We didn't see it as much in the miniseries that I recall. I think there's like one point where you see somebody crucified. Yeah, that's right. But, yeah. but I like mean, drug addict or something. He, <laughs> like, I want to see Sharkmouth Flag in the miniseries or the yeah. upcoming reboot, which I'm sure we're going to talk about. But because there was Sharkmouth Flag in the comic was awesome. That was when he ordered his people to go kill the judge, but to not hurt his face or head yeah. and the guy gets overzealous and shoots him twice in the face and um you know sh- gets rid of his face and teeth essentially and um he's like thinking he's like okay i can't go back i need to go down south and before he can even figure out a plan of how to avoid flag flag appears and like his mouth opens and they show it's like these rows of giant shark teeth and stuff and he just jumps on him and starts eating him and i'm like that's scary why didn't i see that in the miniseries you know like so that's the kind of flag that we need to see. And in, in the days of, you know, now your, your insidiouses and your conjurings and things like that where they can achieve those sorts of things, I'm like, I can't wait till we talk about the upcoming redo of it because I can't wait to see what they're going to do with it. Because the old one, while being okay, um, it, it just didn't do it for me. Now, the comic series, what I was alluding to earlier um, was, uh, or what I basically said was that Reading the comic series, even though it was 31 issues, I could still totally see that so much had been skipped in between issues, in between scenes within issues, where like they had to have thought about more than just this, the character that I'm following at this point, and there had to have been more than just this. Like they just, it was so truncated, I could tell. And so by the end, I was like, I just literally read like a visual Cliff Notes version of of the stand, and I was left dissatisfied because it hit most of the same beats. Um, the artwork is phenomenal. I will say that much. The artwork is phenomenal. It's um, it, Perkins went on to go to do a lot of other stuff with Marvel after this um, in the Avengers and Captain America arena, and um, it's completely understandable as to why uh, his his art is fantastic. But you know it, it, what it said to me and what Marcia and I were talking about a little bit is that ultimately <laughs> the, the the book or the, the, the miniseries and the comic, which I can speak to, and I'm, I'm guessing the book is the same, is it's like it, the idea is cool. Yeah, Stephen King's revelations. To, you know, the human race dies, and then we're amassing a good army, we're amassing a bad army. They never fight. Like, nothing ever happens. There's never a confrontation, really. There's four guys that go over that happen to be God's sacrifice, and then, boom, that's it. And there's no resolution because Flag survives it, at least in the comic. He disappears right before he, like, turns into his devil form and then disappears from his clothes. And then the last scene in the comic is he pops up on a beach somewhere um, with this tribe that immediately drops to their knees and starts worshiping him. And I'm like... So I read 31 issues of jack shit. Like, <laughs> okay, so well, like I, I mean, I, so we lost the good. We lost the good Mother Abigail, who I love, by the way. Mother Abigail's fantastic as a character in in all of literature. But now we just have Flag, and now all was for naught again. And I just it was frustrating. Ultimately, well, the, the, the the whole thing. The Matrix stole their ending because that's is essentially we're resetting the 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 world. Well, yeah, it says, you know, like you know, every, uh, every thousand years, years yeah. there's, there's a great battle saying. between good and evil <laughs> because the balance gets up, upturned, and so there's a big fight, and, you know... It, there isn't a big fight, though. No, that's the problem. No, that's the thing. There, there usually is a big fight, but if, if there's people who are willing to sacrifice themselves for the many, then you don't need to have a big war because four people marching into the lion's den was, was all it took. You don't and need to satisfy your And then also to have audience. one guy betray the whole way. I'm just, I'm just saying, that's part of, I think that's part of, I, I don't think there is a big battle because ultimately the people who believed had faith that there wouldn't need to be a big battle, you know what I mean? Like it was like a way of rewarding the people who were ready to fight. They were comparing numbers and preparing for something. Yeah. Like, well, I, I don't think. They were think, anticipating a battle. Yeah, I, I think the Las Vegas would have won a, a, a war. Yeah, so I that's so. why, I think that's why it, it ends the way it does because otherwise it ends you know, with them rolling tanks down. But that's why it felt like a cop-out ending for me. Like, Mm. I don't know. 
no, no, that's actually a point that I never really thought about is the anticlimactic aspect of all of that. And, well, I you mean, know, I'm actually going to agree with off. Dave that's that I think climactic. Vegas would have won, man, because, it's, I mean, something mm. Glenn Bateman actually says in the novel, he's like, yeah. well, all the techies are going to go to Vegas, and, you know, so yeah. the, the smarter, more, yeah. I guess, technologically sophisticated people, that's the where they would go. <laughs> and the, and, and the non-religious people who were good people, and, you know, who weren't, who weren't uh, susceptible to the influence of Mother Ab- Abigail... You know, those those were innocent people. Yeah, there were a lot of good people yeah. that ended up following the flat. Right. Which so, is fascinating. Again, I think that's all part of Stephen King's, you know, allegorical message that this is his version of like, hey, this is how the world ends and this is what happens. There's people who have something that drives them to do good and something that or people that have drives them to do bad. And then you get the people who are caught in the middle who usually and, are getting And do they feel the that they're side. driven to do yeah. bad? When they're following Flag, are, do they feel like they're bad? Do they know they're the bad guys? I feel like some of them do. Yeah. Well, I think, some of them I think at first you don't, and then you see something and you're like, oh, I better yeah. not cross this guy. Oh, it's too late now. You know, like now I can't leave. Trash Can Man. Right. Like when he sees, the, it's uh, not in the miniseries, but in the book, the, witnessing a crucifixion right. of, a, of someone that was a drug addict, yeah. which is an addiction, which is right. something um, he couldn't, really help you know that that right. he this is a person that had a problem and then uh witnessing that and then seeing that his part in that like is to burn this corpse down basically and like oh but, well, like i don't agree with this but i have a place in this yeah and that that's kind of a weird fascinating right. very dark kind of idea that even if i'm not evil myself i have a place in the evil right and yeah uh, yeah yeah because we can all do evil through our inaction as much as we can do evil through our action, and which is, I think, a big theme in this story, is that the people on Abigail's side are taking action, and they're trying to, they're trying to, you know, re-societize themselves, versus this other group who he's just going to lead this, you know, he's creating an army to go and kill, you know, the good guys. The, the good guys are really just like, hey, let's try to, like, live and be good and, and you know, repopulate the world. And, and Randall has a, an agenda. And I think that's, again, part of that whole religious tone to all of King's uh, books when he has uh, Randall as the antagonist is that uh, you can never really defeat Randall. You can, uh, you can send him to an island or you can send him to another you know, time or place or whatever, but you can't really beat evil. Evil will always be there. And, and the idea, I think, in the end is balance. It's, it's the balance between... You know, you know, we can't have a world that's completely good because th- that wouldn't make sense either. So it has to be, it has to be both. And I think that's why the ending is so lackluster in your opinion because th- that's what, that's how it ends. It ends kind of neutrally. You know, bad guys are wiped out. The good guys never had to go to battle. You know, most of the good guys that we loved are dead. You know, and uh, yeah. I don't yeah. know. I didn't really see the bad side as being bad or the good side really being good. Because there was a bunch of assholes on the good side, too. Right. Yeah. There were. Like, Shades let's be gray. honest here. Yeah, yeah. They, were falling, they were over in Colorado hanging out, but they were also bitching and moaning about having to work and, well, and, ha- and they didn't want to follow everybody. Well, Harold, yeah. You know, like, yeah. they were, like, everybody wanted to do their own thing. So they, they weren't really following each other. They were just kind of there. And then I was actually impressed with what Randall was doing because they were, they were actually rebuilding they were rebuilding society right. over there. They had people who were working. Everybody had yeah. a job. Every, they, they had a goal. Had, they were mobilized. Yeah, they like were, they you know. maybe, Hitler built the Autobahn. I don't think you know? all and, of them were aware that they too. were working <laughs> towards a war or what they were doing, but I think they were just like, I'm here, I have a job, I have control because when you think about the world being wiped out and all of a sudden, oh, I don't have I don't have I don't know what to do. What do I do? All my people are dead. I'm depressed there's just chaos everywhere what do i do and someone tells you well we need somebody to pick up all the dead people okay i'll do that we need somebody to be able to change the light bulbs or run the generator and then you have people who are actually functioning and they're not wallowing in the fact that everyone in the world just died so and then you have the good side who you're supposed to be rooting for but i wasn't i was like i kind of hope they die because they're just (laughs) annoying me they're just crying and they're like oh my god like, I don't know, maybe the, the hormones. I don't know, but I was like... <laughs> That's a harsh assessment, damn. Like, <laughs> just do your job. Like, I was like, at least these people are doing their job. You know, I don't think that 
just killing people for addiction and all that, that's probably not the way to go. But, so um, you're not pro crucifixion. No, I mean, eventually they would have been putting people no. on trains. I mean, that's no. that's where yeah. it would have gone to. No. So like, yeah, it's you know, yeah, yeah what, what made the trains run on time and got the lights running. And yeah. but eventually, you know, you know, it's gonna it's gonna be bad. It's gonna be one or the other, sure. But <laughs> but yeah, I think I think I agree with you with the yeah. both sides. It, 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 the, there's really no side to root for. You're rooting yeah. for the individuals. Mm-hmm. So I think you're supposed to. Yeah. You're supposed to root for the individuals. Yeah, like, yeah, like I said, though. I think Trash Can Man is. Yeah, I was you, rooting you for him root the whole for, time. You know, <laughs> he goes on the evil side, and he's the hero still, of the story. Yeah, he's the hero, so basically, mm-hmm. the weird and the weird, the weird hero. Yeah. Well, no, I, I, I was actually going to say yeah, that in the uncut version of the book, the ending that you found so dissatisfying was added because the book in its original published form just ends with, you know, Franny and Stu basically being like, what's next? You know, should we stick around in Boulder? Should we, you know, go back east? You know, what the hell is going to happen? So it's, it's interesting how King, you know, just wanted to show the recycling cyclical nature of Flag and, you know, tacking oh, so on that, that new ending. So. so Flag in the end wasn't there in the original? Uh, he he didn't do the re- regeneration thing. Yeah, that was added in the in the un- uncut version of the book. So, yeah. uh, what do you guys think about the uh, the new? Because I never read the original version. I only know mm-hmm. the um, resurrection, the extended version. Yeah. Um, what do you think about his updating Stephen King's updating of it? I think he kind of did a sloppy job. As much I as think I so too. King, Honestly, like, because there's yeah. certain like numerical references yeah, about yeah, you know yeah. babysitting for a dollar and stuff like that. Like Larry like, Underwood's backstory l- was very yeah. much that was a very 70s mm-hmm. music scene, not an 80s music scene. It's supposed yeah. to take place in 1990. Yeah. And uh, that was and then there's things like um, Franny talking about how. Um, these like biker movies were popular when she was in high school, mm-hmm. and they were like late '60s, early '70s biker movies that she they would not have been '80s kids were not into that, <laughs> no. like, and not yeah. at all. So it, he kind of he put some there's some references to Pee Wee Herman, which was fun, but yeah. like I I think he could have been, done a better job of updating it to uh, to the '80s. Yeah, and I've never actually read the original version with all of the you know yeah, pop culture references original, and stuff. Yeah. That's a that's a tougher one to track down. So um, it seems he updated some, but not all. Yeah, so yeah. That sloppy was job. It's, a, it's yeah. a big book. It, well, yeah, I feel I'm like he, I feel like the editor should have caught some of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it right? swelled from 800 something to like what 11 and some change. So Jeez. yeah. Jeez. Yeah, and if yeah. the miniseries came out in mid mid 90s, it makes sense. 94. Try mm-hmm. to yeah, try to update it in the early yeah. 90s. Mm-hmm. Well, um, yeah, I, honestly, as far as the comic book goes, it was one that I collected as it was being released, and it took over four years to get through the, the massiveness of it. But, you know, once again, uh, you know, 31 issues is still not enough to really just hit all the different bases, and I, I, I feel Cecil on this, and the fact that, you know, it just felt, it still felt condensed, even though it, it was more of a, a hard and accurate re- representation of the source material. It's still, you know, at, at the end of the day, it's... Uh, it still felt like they just breezed through things as opposed to really going forward through it. But I still still recommend it. I mean, uh, it's it's a lot of fun if you're a fan of the source material, but uh, you need to read the book is what it really boils yeah, down I, to. Yeah, I think this is one of... Um the stand exists as a book. That's the mm-hmm. best form for the story to be told. Like, yeah. there's the miniseries. Um, there's going to be the new miniseries that's happening. Yeah. But I still feel like the novel is the best format for the story. Always is with King's stuff. And yeah, and, and, with, and with most of King's stuff, yeah. yeah. So I have, a, I, I have a question. You're saying it's going to be another miniseries, not like a season Yes, it's going to be a season yeah. series? It's, um, CBS is launching some kind of streaming service or something. Yep, yeah. it's the same um, one that had the oh. Star Trek Discovery on yes. it, if mm-hmm. I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And so at least the plan for now, I'm not sure if Josh Boone is still attached to it or not, but it's supposedly going to be I a 10-part so miniseries yeah. that they're going to do exclusively for that streaming service. See, I think Which it would be better as um, like a TV series. Like series. an actual yeah. series. Ten like parts season. is almost... Yeah, uh, yeah they, they, AMC just now. did The Terror from the Dan Simmons novel, mm-hmm. which was fantastic. That was an excellent... Um, that was the best format for that story. If you're going to take it from novel to... Like, you can't make a movie of that. That would be so truncated that it just wouldn't work. But as a ten-part series, like, that was the perfect format to tell that story in. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. The, so, yeah, maybe it'll be good. Maybe it'll work. I'd yeah, watch a two-and-a-half-hour Trash Can Man movie. It's just his story. Half, yeah. <laughs> just like one whole hour of trash can man. Wouldn't that can be an man, interesting yeah. version of the? Yeah. Which I the book kind of does. You don't see any of the like good side. Multiple sides. chapters on one character. Yeah. Mm-hmm. For like you know 80 pages and it, it works. Mm-hmm. And you can do that in a novel and I think it's harder to do in television or in film or in other formats 
I think that's something you can do with a novel, and that's why I think um, The Stand works best as a novel. Yeah. Truly, truly. So, um, yeah, as we are reaching the finish line at least a little bit, I was curious if anybody has thoughts, questions, if I see a hand jumping up right there, man. So are you recommending the novel? <laughs> <laughs> Have you read the book? Yeah, then, you'll, then you'll enjoy the graphic novel. Graphic novel. Yeah. Then, then I, yeah, I would recommend it because you'll know the things that are missing. I didn't, so I felt like I wasn't getting the full story. But if you've already got the full story in your head somewhere, then I think you'll enjoy seeing the highlights laid out in graphic form. This is, this is my question. <laughs> you said it's 30 or 30 31 issues. 31, yeah. Thirty, 30 issues the, uh, at at three ninety nine. I mean that. There you go. So it's, it'd be a hundred and twenty bucks. You can you can get them you can get them cheaper than that now. I mean that's the big hardcover collection. I think yeah. you can get that for like seventy five or less if you go on Amazon. I, I think so. I mean uh, on Amazon you can probably score it for fifty bucks. Yeah, the art and is And thirty very issues cool. for fifty bucks. That's a good deal. Plus you have a really nice hardcover that can sit next to your other Stephen King hardcovers. Yeah. So I mean Perkins's art is amazing. And like I said, I, I got a shark flag, um, you know, in, in the comic, whereas you guys had to imagine it in the book. Mm -hmm. So that was awesome for me. Um, so if you know the story, then I would say, yeah, the graphic novel is a great way to experience it in a new way. But if you haven't read the full story, I feel like you might have the problems I did with it, which is you're going to feel like you're missing some stuff. Okay. Have another question. Uh, girl with the pink in the hair, what's up? Yeah, that's a yeah. rough one. <laughs> And I think that's something television can do now, is that um, like a TV series made now, I think, could cover the story and could explore those characters in the ways they deserve to be explored. Um, Walking Dead opened up that whole yeah, thing. Season, season yeah, season one cliffhanger, yeah, Captain just, Trips gets loose. <laughs> season two, yeah, you know. You, you could do it no, in Texas. You, would, you, would, you, don't, you don't want to drag it out that long. I think it would be a good... But, but you could. I think, well, 13, could. I think 13 episodes yeah. would be solid. I think at most two 10-episode seasons would be as long as you could drag it out uh, realistically without getting The Walking Dead I think the television today is closer tiredness. to um, uh, novels than films. Yeah. Is, and, and they're able to tell these types of stories mm -hmm. in these extended formats that, that you couldn't do before. Mm -hmm. So I think a, a new version of The Stand uh, would work better in television today than it would in the 90s. Yeah, mm -hmm. has to happen, has to happen. Purple, yes. So I, I will agree um, with you that um, Lloyd is my favorite character. 
favorite character. Hmm? Um, now, I, I will say to you, I've never read the book, but I'm going out and buying the book now. That's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> you got that. Mm-hmm. And none of us really knows what we would do if we were in his situation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In a prison cell. Mm-hmm. And I, I Chomping on the legs of the... <laughs> yeah, and, and yes, maybe the book probably goes a little bit Yeah, it does. Much yeah. more so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm curious now, too. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, we don't know when we're in there facing starvation. Um, right. And what would we do if somebody handed us a key? You know, would we follow that person? But you see that in the, in the miniseries, and you see then how conflicted we become. Yeah. But he also he also really knows that he sold his soul. Like he knows better yeah. than anybody else. Cause and he, he was, accepts it too. <laughs> he was in that cell. He could have said no, and he could have died in the cell. But he chose to live, and that was the price he knew he had to pay. And it was a terrible choice. But right, like you said, do we all make that same sinking ship? Yeah, desperation. But with Lloyd, he was not an angel, and that's no. why he was no, in yeah, prison no. to begin with. And but, and but it he was, was interesting kind of dragged to along, see though, a little bit. It was interesting to see him turn around because even though he did he did make the choice, he did decide to follow that path. He realized later on like that wasn't who he wanted to be, and he wanted he, like Flag gave him a chance to be a better person, even though being a better person <laughs> really made him a really bad person. <laughs> so <laughs> right. forced to do really bad things. So um, he was a very interesting character. Complex, yeah. Uh, gentleman right over there. And just to comment on the dissatisfaction of the ending a little bit. Yeah. Outside of the notion that it is cyclical and, and evil always comes back, Stephen King's other books, he has a little bit of a, a problem with how he kills his bad guys. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's such a great character writer and he takes so long to develop them. They are so truly great. He doesn't want to kill them. He doesn't. And then no. how they get killed is usually a little sketchy, maybe, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You look at the end, or you look at Insomnia, or a bunch of others. He wants to bring them back. Yeah. Right. Well, and I think I think again that's part of his his message to the the world is that you know evil can never be defeated. It can never stop it. You can you can the only thing you're supposed to do is fight against it. And all his characters always just fight. You know. Yeah. Right. Nice. Over there. I remember buying the original book, reading it, and then devouring the um, Stanford yeah. that came out. But for the last several years, I've also been looking and watching Walking Dead and seeing how much it owes to Stanford. Oh, it yeah. takes a lot of inspiration. <laughs> you know, Negan and Flag are twins. <laughs> as far as charisma and all that goes. All yeah. and, and what they set up. You know, the the um, survivors the New World Order. Right. Another show that actually is weirdly influenced by The Stand, I think, is uh, The Last Man on Earth, mm-hmm. which is the comedy show. <laughs> but, like, it, yeah, it takes the apocalypse seriously. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a comedy show, but it, it's, it's, yeah. It's darkly funny. It's very dark, yeah. And if you like The Stand, that's yeah. a, the funny version of, of that story. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Comments? All right, guys. Oh, oh, we got, oh, we got one more. more, then we'll tag before we go. <laughs> I think you can expect that more from Castle Rock coming Castle up. Rock, yeah. Yeah. Castle Rock That's is coming up. And yeah, they're, uh, Mark Bernardin is uh, a guy that works with Kevin Smith on Fat Man on Batman, and he's one of the writers of Castle Rock, and he's talking about how they're going to do some really cool stuff like that on wait. that show. So. July, right? The Stand? Yeah. Yeah, I'm mm-hmm. sure. Yep. Yeah, yeah they, they, they are moving ahead with a 10 part miniseries. Yep. Mm-hmm. So thank you guys very much for joining us. Thank Make sure you, you go to. Uh, 
YouTube.com slash The Horror Show channel if you want to uh, join us. We do two episodes every single day. We are running four more panels. We have the Pet Cemetery 30th, 35th anniversary tonight. Uh, room an It o'clock. comparison panel tomorrow. A great horror debate live. And then what goes wrong in horror movies is our other panel. So thank you guys, thank you guys very Gracias, much. Thank you everybody.